Okay, so we can see maybe a few more seconds for the audience. Okay, all right, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to our webinar series, uh, APRU Food Security Webinar Series 2024. So APRU, as you may know, um, Association of Pacific Rim Universities uh, Food Security Webinar. So um, uh, there's a growing emphasis on regional efforts to extend the shelf life of food and foster collaboration in precision agriculture technology uh, as consumers increasingly seek locally sourced options. So to address this new trend, the APRU Food Security Working Group was formed in 2023 with the inaugural uh, representatives from Canada, the U United States, Singapore, Taiwan, and Australia. So the working group strives to contribute to the process of forming new solutions by bringing out collective research capabilities and the outcomes from the APRU network. So that's the background of this webinar. So uh, out of three planned webinar series, this is, today is the first webinar. So next page, please. So today's speakers, um, uh, I mean, uh, we co-hosted from the Simon Fraser University in Canada and the uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, so two speakers are uh, set for 20 minutes each. Uh, uh, Dr. Bing Lu, assistant professor in SFU, and Dr. Jie Han Zhou, uh, the postdoc uh, researcher in the University UC Davis. Uh, next page, please. So first, uh, I want to acknowledge, acknowledge the land first. So uh, the, one of the co-hosts, uh, Simon Fraser University, respectfully acknowledges the um, Muskua, uh, Squamish, uh, Tsilai, Wachu, Katsi, uh, Kukatlam, Kwekwet, uh, Kwantlan, Semiamu, and the Chuasen peoples on whose unceded traditional territories, our three com uh, campuses reside. Next, please. Okay, so myself, <laughs> uh, Wu Kim from SFU. I'm the professor in the School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering and the scientific director of the British Columbia Center for Agritech Innovation. And the co-host from the UC Davis side, Professor Ermias Cab uh, Cabri, the Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. So uh, Professor uh, Cabri uh, will take over the uh, second half of the uh, moderation today. Next page, please. All right, so uh, the agenda today, uh, I'm gonna uh, invite and uh, uh, listen our kind of uh, APRU Chief Executive, uh, Professor Thomas Schneider's uh, brief talk, and then we can move on deep dive into two webinar series today. So the, the first webinar is investigating blueberry scotch virus infection uh, using uh, drone-based imaginary and deep learning, and then Q&A 10 minutes. And the second uh, webinar talk will be uh, the sustainable temperature controls, a critical step for ensuring food safety and quality uh, will be given by Dr. Jian Zhou from UC Davis and then another 10 minute Q&A. And finally, we're gonna have a group discussion today. Next page, please. So I'm gonna uh, invite uh, our basically boss host, <laughs> Professor Thomas Schneider of the APRU, and uh, we, we can listen his um, overview of APRU activities. Professor Schneider, please. 
Yes, thank you so much. Um, can you please show my presentation, the first slide? So I would like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to all the participants and also to thank very much uh, our two host universities today, Simon Fraser University and UC Davis for investing all the work and effort in um, co-organizing this webinar. I think it's uh, uh, boding well for um, a, a great start into what might be a new project hub for APIU. So just to give you a brief overview, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities APRU or APIU is a vast consortium of 60 leading research universities across 20 economies of the Asia Pacific and you see here the list um, of all member economies and member institutions. And the purpose of this association is to foster dialogue and cooperation in education, in research, in public policy across one of the world's largest macro regions, the Pacific Rim. The mission of APIU is to bring together researchers, thought leaders from other sectors, such as the corporate sector um, and policymakers, to develop solutions to the grand challenges of the Asia Pacific. We try to educate and mentor students also on how to create change. We help share knowledge. We facilitate cultural understanding across this vast region. Um, APIU was founded in 1997 by the presidents of four California institutions, the University of Southern California, UCLA, UC Berkeley, and Caltech. Since our establishment 27 years ago, we have leveraged our members' collective education and our research cap capabilities, as well as our members' institutional networks and their cultural reach. And the purpose always has been to engage with a vast and varied range of partners. I just, if you look here to the right side, bottom side of my slide, I just give you a, a couple of our partners. There are many more, but we engage with agencies of the United Nations, uh, the Asia Development Bank, the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation, uh, the corporate sector. We had a large project financed by Google, for example, but there are many more of those uh, corporate partners and NGO partners. We wish to create societal impact to translate research into solutions, including policy and practice. The next slide, please. So this gives you an uh, overview to the uh, top right of some of our key research related programs that facilitate solutions to the grand challenges of the Asia Pacific. As you see here, Global Health is one of these program hubs, multi-hazards, biodiversity, we have hubs on sustainability and the digital economy. And the food security um, is a potential uh, hub that could be added uh, to these program hubs under the umbrella of the grand challenges of the Asia Pacific. So all these programs um, comprise a large variety of activities from research facilitation to student engagement activities, workshops, competitions, et cetera, to actual work on drafting policies that then can be implemented. And what I also would like to emphasize here, we engage very intensely with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you look to the left side, you know, the print is too, um, too tiny to be read, but this is a list of all our activities. And what is essentially for you here to recognize are the numbers these are the SDGs with which our many activities engage. You see, we are very active in terms of our um, engagement with the SDGs. And then I'm grateful to one of our partners, Elsevier. Uh, if you look in the middle bottom, this gives you a chart that um, shows uh, the relative impact index uh, for um, research um, delivered by our member universities um, about the SDGs. Uh, the world average here is uh, defined to be one, and we are approximately at, at 1.4, so 40% above the world average, which shows uh, how intensely our member universities are engaged in SDG-related uh, research. The next slide, please, um, gives you a bit of an overview why we are doing uh, this webinar series on precision agriculture and food shelf life in the Asia Pacific. 
so food security is, as you all know, a key global and regional challenge, but it also has been defined as a new focus area of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Um, we try to start this webinar series um, as a pilot um, with the purpose to identify if there is interest and also how much interest there is to develop a network of cross-disciplinary experts from all our institutions who wish to collaborate to address as a collective food security challenges within the region. And this should be a, a more engaged and more intense collaboration than just uh, partnering on joint uh, published papers. So this, these webinars will be a platform uh, to share insights from experts um, on food security from APIU member institutions who all focus on local issues, but the idea is to learn how these local um, insights can be translated into regional and global food security solutions. The format, as you know, uh, we will be delivering a series of three webinars uh, with two universities presenting per each web webinar. The participants should ideally aim, of course, to join all or multiple webinar sessions. And I just indicated here the next uh, two webinar dates. Uh, there are always two days here indicated. The first one is for the um, Americas. The second date is um, day is for the for the Asia region. So February twenty second and twenty third is the next uh, iteration of the webinar. Uh, no, this is the first one today, and then May first and second is the second one, and June twentieth and twenty first will be the third one. So I would really want to encourage all participants to engage in the discussions and the questions and answer sessions to make these sessions as interactive and informative as possible. That is the whole purpose of the webinars, to see how much interest there is across our members. And the next steps will then be to deter determine what uh, degree of interest exists uh, in order to develop an impactful collaborative network of like-minded academics, uh, to assess uh, needs in terms of capacity and to define maybe areas of mutual interest uh, to move this to the next step. And we might also send out a questionnaire uh, a bit later at the end of the webinar series to assess uh, interest and to gain a bit more concrete feedback on how you uh, saw and experienced those webinars and what your interest is. So I would really want to encourage you to participate lively. Uh, thank you so much for um, coming together to attend. And I give over back to Wusu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Schneider. So um, as, as uh, Professor Schneider mentioned, we understand the objective of this APRU um, food security webinar. So let's deep dive into two uh, webinar series today. So first of all, uh, Simon Fraser University's assistant professor, uh, Dr. Bing Lu's talk. So I'm going to hand over to Bing. So Bing, please uh, share your screen and uh, go ahead. Looking forward to it. Sure, thanks. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Bing Lu. I'm an assistant professor in geography department at Simon Fraser University in Canada. My research background is remote sensing. So I use remote sensing such as drone image or UAV image together with satellite image and angry tech to evaluate crop health and soil health. So today my presentation is about using UAV image to investigate one virus influencing the blueberry, so named Scotch. So here is the overview of my presentation. Firstly, I will introduce this virus and why, as well as why I use the UAV image for investigating this virus, then my data collection, data analysis, and lastly, my future work. So introduction to Scotch virus. So this virus uh, was first found in British Columbia in Canada in about 2000 and after about 20 years, right now it's all over the province. So really significantly influenced the blueberry yield. So the blueberry is very important uh, in Canada, in the US, Brazil, and many other countries. So it's very important to monitor this Scotch virus and reduce its influence. 
So on this slide, the first figure showing a healthy bush, so which is very healthy and grown, and the next two figures showing the uh, infected bush with different severity levels of the infection. The second image showing the kind of medium infection, and the third image showing very high severity. So clearly, such high severity infection will significantly reduce the blueberry yield. So these are some uh, further photos showing the symptoms of the infection. So one big issue of this scotch virus, it can spread from one plant to another plant or from one bush to another bush by aphid and shown here. So it can easily spread from one field to another field. So that's one big issue. So let's see, we identified the scotch virus in this field this year, and next year we may identify this virus in the neighboring fields, so indicating the spread of the scotch virus. So it's critical for us to detect the spread and also identify the location as well as the percentage of the scotch virus infection, and then we can take some measures to control the spread and infection. So if we can use some measures to find the infected bushes and then we can remove these bushes and also use some pesticide to control the aphids. So these are different measures we can reduce the spread and then we can save the resources such as we reduce the use of the water as well as the uh, fertilizer on these infected bushes because no matter how much more water or how much more fertilizer we use on these infected bushes, their production, their yield will still be low. So it does not make lots of sense to continue to use lots of resources on these unhealthy or infected bushes or the plants. So it's also important to detect the um, virus infection as early and then to support the insurance claim. So how we can um, detect the virus infection? So we can do the human evaluation in the field and showed here, which is pretty reliable. So we can have the field team to go to the field and find the plants with infection symptoms. However, this uh, human-based survey is time-consuming and labor-intensive. It could take a few days or weeks to survey a large farm and showed here. So another way is possibly using the remote sensing and showed here using the drone image or the UAV image as well as the satellite image to take an image something like this and showed here. If we can use a remote sensing model to detect and classify the infected bushes on this image and then it could be more efficient and save the labor and energy. So another advantage of the remote sensing is if we can collect the image from different years, such as three years image and showed here, and then we can monitor the spatial and temporal variations of the spread, such as we found 10% infection in year one, 50% infection in year two, and then 60% in year three. So that clearly indicates the um, more spread in this field, so which we can only do using the remote sensing image, not by the field survey. So this is a motivation for us to use the remote sensing to identify the virus infection in the field. So next I will introduce um, my study area. So that's in a, a city named Pet Meadows. It's about one hour drive uh, east of Vancouver. So here shows the location of Simon Fraser University right in the middle. So for our field surveys, we selected different blueberry varieties, such as shown here. So these different varieties of the uh, blueberries, they have different resistance to the scotch virus. So that's why we want to check which variety could be more uh, healthy in the uh, infection. So we selected about 100 to 200 samples for each variety. And we did the field survey in May and June in 2022, most work in that year, but we also did some survey in 2023. So the second and third uh, image showing the infection of the virus with different severity levels. We decided to evaluate the severity in the field and um, assign a number of the severity from one to five. The so number one indicate pretty low severity level and number five indicate pretty high severity level because these different severity levels, see how different 
um, signals on the image, which is critical for us to analyze the image. We also collected leaf samples from these infected plants and sent to a lab to confirm the infection of the virus, so which is reliable. So next, I will talk about the collection of the UAV image. So the above two figures showing the UAV platforms we used. The one on the left, that's multi-router, which is very common to use. And we also tried to test another UAV platform, which is on the right. So that's a hybrid version using both the multi-router as well as the fixed wing technologies. So next, I will play a video to show you how we use this uh, hybrid UAV to collect image. So later you will see this UAV will be launched vertically and then fly forward as a, a fixed wing UAV. Yeah, so this type of UAV is more efficient than the multi-rotors showed on the left, so it can save more battery. So the image uh, on the bottom is the UAV image we, uh, we took in the blueberry field. Next, so these are some examples of the UAV image as well as the surveyed uh, plants. So these are different rows of the blueberry plants and these col different colors of plants indicating the surveyed plants with their healthy plants or the infected plants. So these are different um, farm fields we collected the image. Next, I will talk about the deep learning modeling. So the um, UAV image can provide lots, lots of information. So it is important to extract information from these uh, UAV images and analyze information to tell really these are healthy uh, blueberry plants or maybe infected plants. So we decide to use the deep learning model, which is very powerful to extract both the spectral information as well as the uh, spatial information from the image. For instance, so the healthy plants, so they are green and also very uh, high density, but for the infected bushes, so the color could be yellow or brown. So these are some uh, signals we can capture using UAV image. So see if on the image we see that very green, color and also very dense canopy, most likely that's a very healthy bush. But if on the image, that's a small, small plant and also very uh, sparse canopy, so likely that's a weak or unhealthy or infected plant. So using such difference, we can tell on the image, so where the healthy plants are and also where the infected plants are. So eventually we generate a map, something um, showed here, so with different colors. So the green color indicating the healthy plants and also the yellow color indicating the infected plants. So from this image and then from this map, and then we can roughly estimate the percentage of the infection. So see on this map, it could be 5% infection. So that's pretty a significant level of infection. And then the growers will need to take timely management measures to control the infection and also reduce the spread, which is very important, not just for their own farms, but also important for the health of the plants, for their neighbor's uh, farm fields. So next, I will show some mapping result. So here, the this figure showing the um, one blueberry field we surveyed. And if you can see clearly, there are different circles on this on this figure with different numbers. So such as number zero indicating that's a very healthy plant, and number five indicating the uh, very high variety of very high variety of the infection. So very unhealthy plant, and then we use the deep learning model to extract the information from this image. So such as extracting the healthy uh, plant information as well as the unhealthy plant information from this figure. And then analyzing this information in the deep learning model and generate a very fine detailed map and showed here. So as just mentioned, the green color indicating the healthy, uh, 
healthy plants, and then the yellow color indicating the infected plants. So this farm field which much higher infection level. So uh, based on our statistic, so this farm could be about 50 or even higher infection, so which is a pretty high um, level infection, so which the uh, farmers will need to take serious measures to control the infection. Here showing more mapping result. So besides using deep learning models, we also trying to test some other uh, machine learning models such as the random forest based um, classification model. And then we want to compare the results from these different models, some maps from the deep learning models and some maps from the machine learning models. And then we want to compare the mapping accuracy and see which map is more accurate, can better represent the infection levels in the farm. So uh, besides uh, comparing different models, we also try to test the different spatial resolution of image. Um, if you used the UAV before, you know, we can fly the UAVs at different altitudes, such as uh, 50 meters above the ground, or maybe 100 or 200 meters above the ground. And then we will get the image with different spatial resolutions. So these different um, image spatial resolution will provide different levels of details. So for sure, high image resolution will provide more image details than Theoretically, we will provide more information, more uh, details regarding the infection. However, that will um, bring down the imaging of flight efficiency. So if we fly the drones at lower altitude to get high image resolution, and then it will take much longer time, maybe double the time to fly over the entire uh, study area. So that's a trade-off between the image resolution, image quality, and so on the imaging efficiency. So we try to collect image with different resolutions and then to test which resolution is kind of the optimal resolution for the um, serving the scotch virus. So which will generate very accurate map results as well as very high mapping uh, efficiency. So that's the, um, my research result. So here I would like to talk about my future work. So and um, from 2022 until this year, we have tried to use the drone image or UAV image to map the scotch virus in one farm field as uh, the result I just discussed. So in the future, the next few years, we try to scale up the monitoring to multiple fields still using the UAV image. And then we can help the growers directly to evaluate the infection level as well as tell the uh, percentage of infection and then help the growers to control. So that's um, mapping individual farm fields or multiple farm fields that's doable using the UAV image. However, if we want to map the infection level for large region and then it is more feasible to use the satellite image and shown here. However, there's also trade-off between the satellite image as well as the UAV image. Using UAV image, we can get a high spatial resolution, but it takes much longer time to fly over a large region. Using the satellite image, we can easily cover a large region. However, the spatial resolution is lower. So there are some trade-off between using UAV image as well as the satellite image. So we want to compare these two different technologies and see which one is better for different purpose. So maybe just using UAV image for uh, farm scale monitoring and help the farmers directly, but using the satellite image to help the industry and help the government to get a better idea how much um, percentage of the blueberry fields are infected in this region or in the province. So next, the third point would be track the spread of the uh, scotch virus using um, multiple year image. So let's say if we collect image every, every two years or every uh, three years, and then we can track the percentage change of the infection. Say in the year one, 20%, and year two, maybe 30%. So that's an indication of the higher infection. But if in year three, it reduced to 10% or 5%, so that's indicating uh, effective control of the infection, which is important for the, uh, for the scotch virus management. And then I want to acknowledge uh, my funding um, from the BC Blueberry Council and also Canada's digital technologies cluster as well as Matex. 
but we also want to thank our growers who allow us to use their farms and the study area, and also thanks to my collaborators from the BC Ministry of Agriculture, BC Blueberry Council, as well as the Agriculture Angry Food Canada, together with uh, with some industry collaborators from Taramara and iOpen Technologies. Also thanks to uh, some of my students um, who helped with the data collection. Okay, thanks for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Bing. Um, it was quite uh, inspiring talk to see the depths of your uh, uh, example of your uh, drone based, right? The blueberry kind of infection study. So um, uh, now we open the question session to the audience. If there's any question, please raise your hands. Maybe if, oh, there's a one. Yeah, Mingju, please. You're muted, I think, Mingju. Yeah. Oh, good. Is it right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, th thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'm not engineering people, so so. Uh, but but your study is amazing. But I have one question here because the, the usually uh for the crop or the infection preventing may be more important than than when you look at something happening here. So I would like I just wondering how sensitivity. So um. It's a very, very minor symptom you, you already can detect or you need to become some, something like a more severe. I think that's quite important because when you have a minor symptom, they might be in fact all over the crop. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. That's very good. So yes, so the symptoms can be uh, pretty low or pretty clear. So that's why we selected different um, serrated, serrated levels in our study. Um, we have um, five serrated levels from, say, from one to five. So one indicating very low serrated, which, which co correspond to some uh, very minor symptoms. And serrated five correspond to very clear and severe uh, symptoms. So uh, right now we have tried to focus on the threat level from three to five, and our model performed quite good to detect these high threat symptoms. Uh, we are also trying to further our research to test model on the low threat, so threat level one and two. So uh, I will know more results. So in the next few months, and then I can I can uh, I can talk. So how the model performs and how this technology performs for the low varieties. But that's a good question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bing, I have a, uh, two questions for you. So one is, um, other than the virus infection study for blueberry, what are the, uh, 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 the studies are you planning or already done for blueberry using drone, right? For example, uh, can you see the, uh, the volume of blueberry fruits, right? Or something like that. So that uh, if it would be great to share that uh, insight. The other mm -hmm. question is, other than blueberry, I think uh, it's great to give some breadth of your study to others too. What are the crops? Uh, are you interested in, or are you already studied in uh, British Columbia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question, Wusso. So yes, using the UAV technology or the remote sensing technology in general, so we can uh, investigate different features of the blueberries, such as the yield. So we're also trying to use the drone image to quantify the uh, canopy size and so on the canopy color of the blueberry plants or blueberry bush and then we will have more clear ideas the potential yield for the blueberry um, and then we want to collect image such as during the flowering season and then we can make some predictions for the yield and then the farmers can have an early idea how much blueberry they can harvest this year so that's one topic we want to explore using the remote sensing image for the yield estimation. So another topic, we want to use the satellite image, more the um, thermal imaging to evaluate the 
damage of the drought or the heat wave. So the because climate change, the heat wave as well as the drought is more severe and more frequent in BC and maybe in some other regions, countries all over the world. So bring lots of damage to the local crops. So we want to use thermal imaging and maybe also some um, optical imaging to evaluate the potential damage because of high temperature, because of the low water availability, and how the blueberry plants respond in the heat waves and also the droughts, and eventually how much the yield can potentially reduce after the heat wave or after a drought. So that's a second topic. So how the damage, um, how the damage from the heat wave and also drought. Um, so yes, besides the blueberries, um, in the past I tried to use the drone imaging as well as the helicopter-based imaging to evaluate the health of the, the other crops such as weeds. So using the imaging um, technologies, we can get clear ideas, their healthy conditions. So if there's any water damage, or if there's any uh, water stress, or if there's any um, disease, or maybe uh, shortage of the fertilizers, so they will generate different signals on the on the images, and then using the image, we can get clear ideas, the healthy condition of the crops for a large field. So that's the advantage for the remote sensing. So we can help farmers or the uh, professionals to go to the field to evaluate the crop health, but that's not efficient. So we'll be labor intensive and also costly if we can fly drones or collect satellite image to evaluate the crop health, no matter the disease or the water shortage or the fertilizer shortage. And then we can generate different maps showing these different uh, features and share with the farmers. So the farmers will have a clear idea about the healthy conditions of the crops in their farms. And then they can apply the fertilizer or maybe apply the um, irrigation to the needed areas, so only in the needed areas, not to the entire farm, because some areas in the farm could be still healthy. They don't need more water or more fertilizer, but some other areas, they need more water, more fertilizer. So that's what we call the precision agriculture. Only apply the resources, no matter water or fertilizer or pesticide, only in the needed areas, save the resource and also save our environment. So that's that agri tech. Good. Thank you so much. So yeah, that's a uh, that's actual precision agri agri tech and agriculture. So um, that's uh, maybe another question I have for you too. So do you plan to have some combination of uh, two activities like uh, scanning and uh, image analysis like this together with uh, so um, the application of chemicals and etc. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also uh, one one question I have been thinking thinking a lot. So the research research on the agri talk agri tech is important, but the application of the agri tech to the industry. So that's another another question. So here in the universities, we can develop the deep learning models using very advanced sensing technologies. However, these uh, these models could be pretty. Uh, challenging for the um, industry or for the government people or for the growers to use. So how we can develop some technologies that are easy enough for the industry people, for government or the farmers to utilize. And then that's, uh, that's one important component, uh, component for my research, not just for publications, but also uh, think about how the industry can utilize the technologies we developed Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. going to open uh, kind of one or two last questions from audience, if there's any. Otherwise, we can move to second, um, right? So second webinar. So is there any questions? Seeing none. <laughs> oh, yeah. Question from Christina. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, I have a thank you, um, Professor for the very interesting presentation. I have a question regarding the implementation of UAV and satellite imagery technologies for the prevention and control of viruses across larger regions. Since the viruses, as you presented, spread across farms, and th so they don't stop at one farm and go to the next, um, but the use of the technologies is probably quite expensive still. Do you know if there are any plans 
um, to offer or already are implemented uh, to use such technologies for large scale assessment of areas across multiple farms, maybe by regional or local farming associations, for example, or by local governments? Yeah, that's a very good question. So yes, our uh, project um, is also a collaboration with the BC government, Ministry of Agriculture. So they supported our, our research. So we're also trying to um, transfer our technology and also the method to the government and see if they can support more farmers, more growers in the, in the region. So that's also what I just mentioned to uh, develop some easier uh, models that has reasonable accuracy, but also importantly, the government people and also industry people, they can utilize these technologies. So, and then the government, they will also figure out the funding support for the industry and for the uh, farm owners, the growers to utilize these technologies. So in the um, energy, uh, in the technology transfer and also application, so the, uh, the support from government will be very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bing. So um, let, let's uh, give a round of applause to uh, Bing, and then let's move on to second talk from UC Davis. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Hermias for the moderation and the talk. Hermias, please. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Usuda. That was the, definitely a fascinating presentation. Um, so the, 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 the next uh, is um, Dr. Jiehan uh, So. Uh, who is a, a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Food Science and Technology at UC Davis. She has an interest in sustainable bio-based functional materials. She has done a lot of work uh, on this in this area. And so as part of her doctoral work, uh, uh, Dr. Zoho is a key inventor of uh, jelly ice. She will tell us what, what that means um, and has been instrumental in its development. She transformed this visionary idea into a tangible prototype, and now she is leading this effort to, to transition the jelly ice technology from laboratory innovation to a practical everyday application. So uh, looking forward to listen to your presentation. Go ahead, please, uh, Dr. Zhou. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Capri. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Jahan. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity for the platform APRU is providing us to discuss about food security, particularly through the length of our innovative cre uh, creation jelly ice, uh, which is a novel cooling agent that we designed for sustainable temperature control. Um, I've been working on this uh, project along with Dr. Gon Sun and Dr. Lu Xing Wang for the past five years. Um, today, we'll share some inspiration behind our research, uh, why we decided to do this research, what we were able to achieve, and some key takeaways that we garnered throughout our journey. So before we got into any details, let's talk about why foods uh, provide a safe food supply chain is vital. As we all know, food, they're rich in nutrients and they're very susceptible to spoilage if they are not stored properly in the right temperature range. Typically, USDA is suggesting a food danger zone of 4.4 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius, which means that we should try our best to preserve uh, perishable food away from this danger zone to avert the growth of pathogens. Uh, and food cold chain is created to uh, be our guardian of the fresh food supply. However, because of its complex ability, temperature disruption is very commonly seen in the food cold chain. And this temperature instability not only raises the risk of foodborne illness, uh, which is in the US alone cost more than $50 billion annually in health impacts, but also contributes to the significant food waste. We are looking at about 300 kilograms per person per year of food waste in developed countries, which is a significant contrast to the global food shortage that we are facing right now. So food and agricultural organization from the United Nations is warning that there will be a 150% increase in food demand by 2050 globally. 
uh, which means that we're definitely in the front line of reducing food loss. Moreover, in the past several years, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have observed a significant shift of consumption and trading pattern in food sector. We can feel that there is now a preference towards home delivery services, uh, where stable food cold supply chain become even crucial in the promising food safety and reducing food waste. Um, a significant portion of food items there suggested to be best preserved at the temperature range between zero to four degrees Celsius. And to maintain this range, the food industry has very commonly used cooling agents. And the major two we want to mention today, one is the traditional ice and the other is plastic ice packs. So traditional ice is most commonly seen phase change material in the food sector. It is very uh, efficient uh, for cooling and is also very cost effective. However, when using ice uh, with, uh, with food, it raises two primary issues. One is the substantial water consumption and the other is the production of melt water upon the filling. As we can see here, we have a tank of seafood cooled by ice. Um, when ice melts, they revert to water, which means the recycling is very challenging. And more critically, the resulted melt water can pose a risk of microbial cross-contamination. What we can see here is suppose we have a very fresh tank of seafood, but only one tiny piece of that fish is rotten. However, the pathogens in this rotten piece of food can already be transmitted all over to the whole tank of seafood through the melt, melt water. So melt water is definitely the issue that we want to um, have a better solution. Is there any current solution available? Yes, there is. And there are very commonly seen petroleum-based gel packs that uh, we see in the market. They are typically widely used in those home service delivery services, but if we take a closer look at them, we can see all the commercial gel packs. They are covered with very thick outlayer made with petroleum-derived polymers. Mostly they're HDPE or LDPE, non-degradable. And what's inside is liquid filling materials. And a lot of the cases, they're also based on synthetic polymers. Um, those liquid fillings, they actually poses a secondary risk that if the outside damage is damages, uh, outside packages damages, the inside filling can leach out and further compromise the food quality. And what's most importantly is that those cooling packs, they are designed to be reusable. Yet often, especially when we, we receive them in the food delivery packages, we as the end users, we don't know how we should repurpose them. And eventually they frequently end up as the non-degradable plastic waste. Based on the above background, we came up with the question, can we create a alternative solution, which we call jelly ice here. In this proposed ideal cooling media, we hope to achieve the above goals. One, it should have no melt water. Two, it ha should have very high cooling efficiency, very comparable to regular ice or gel packs. Three, we want them to be customizable in shape and size so that we can purpose them according to different application scenarios. And four, we want them to be reusable and very robust. Um, five, we want to build this whole system with bio mass-based material, not involving any petroleum-based polymers. And six, because of the reusability expectation, we want this material to have a optimal microbial resistant performance. And lastly, but most importantly, this material is supposed to be compostable. So based on the above expectations, we built up several prototypes um, and we call them in general jelly ice. We don't have all the time to go in details how we make um, those jelly ice in the lab, but um, you can find all the details documented in the um, uh, in these um, publications. They're all available online. 
And today we'll be more focused on the performance that Jelly Eyes is able to provide and talk about the reason why they're able to achieve these goals. So the first key feature that we expected to see with Jelly Eyes is the no melt water feature. Um, to test this, we have this piece of yellow colorant dyed PVA hydrogel to simulate a piece of food to be chilled. And the yellow colorant was used to simulate the pathogens potentially exist on the surface of food. At the bottom, um, we are putting ice or jelly ice to cool this piece of um, mimicking food. On the left, we can see ice is used. And after ice fell, definitely they generated a big tank of melt water. And so you can see the spread out of yellow colorant, which means the potential cross contaminations caused by the melt water after ice felt. But on the right, jelly ice, they stay exactly the same prior filling or post filling. You don't see any physical status change with jelly ice, and neither we observe any spread out of pathogens with the yellow colorant spread out. So definitely jelly ice is able to achieve the non-melt water feature, but how efficient they are as a new pooling agent. So we simplify the situation with a similar experimental setup. We still have that piece of PVA hydrogel dyed with yellow colorant sitting on the top. And on the bottom, we support this whole system with a big ch a chunk of ice or jelly ice. And we monitor the temperature change of those PVA hydrogels with a thermocouple on the top. And we trap the whole system with a thermal insulation well to reduce air circulation and heat exchange between inner and out, outer environment. And by observing the temperature change of that PVA hydrogel, we can see jelly ice on the right figure, uh, which is shortened as JIC, jelly ice cubes. Um, they're able to achieve very similar performance as ice does. And FTC 1, 3, and 5 here means freeze those cycle, cycles. So we tested jelly ice um, uh, against five free cell cycles. And as you can see here, there is no much of a difference observed as of the cooling efficiency of jelly ice. So this definitely exhibit a good cooling efficiency as well as the potential in reusability of jelly ice. So we dive further and study the details about the reusability of jelly ice and um, here we're simply uh, listing several prototypes that we are able to achieve in the previous study. Um, two representatives, one is the uh, blue dot represented gel JICs, which is made with virgin gelatin hydrogels. And the yellow dots, they are um, gel MSB JICs. They are gelatin hydrogels photo cross-linked with malodion sodium bisulfite which is a water-soluble vitamin K derivative with really high photosensitivity. And we use MSB as a photosensitizer to cross-link gelatin hydrogels in these samples. And by the comparison, we can see when we compare about the latent heat of fusion of these um, jelly ice cubes, they all obtain very high latent heat of fusion, which is exactly the reason that supports their high cooling efficiency towards the previous uh, mimicking food piece. And what we can see here along 10 AFTC, which is application free cell cycles, they maintain very stable performance, especially for gel MSB JICs, they're super stable. Um, so you can see also in the water, uh, content profile, they also remain pretty stable, which means that inside of them, the total water content remain very stable. And the Latin keto fusion stability also indicates that the freezable water inside these hydrogels, they also remain very stable. So if we look at the uh, overall cooling efficiency, um, the whole re repeatability remain pretty high along 10 freeze fill cycles. And another additional feature with jelly ice compared to commercial gel packs is that jelly ice, they are proven to be very customizable in shape and size. So make uh, customizable shape and size we can achieve with two ways with jelly ice. We can either mold them into 
different figures directly from the beginning, or we can mold a big chunk and then slice them up into smaller pieces so that they can better fit the shape of the items to be cool. Here we are using a piece of grape to mimic uh, the situation and explain what is the difference. So on the left, we have a big chunk of jelly ice. They're just sitting there as a regular ice pack that you can see in most of the um, food packages. Um, they don't have a perfect contact with the cooled item, which means that on the right, they have a very slow heat exchange rate. But um, figure two here, we cut the jelly ice into smaller pieces so that they can have a better contact with the grape. So on the right, um, you can see with uh, small JICs, they have a much quicker heat exchange rate compared to the bigger ones. Um, apart from the valve features uh, as a potential material have direct contact with food and be reusable, it is critical that we can promise these materials are very easy to be cleaned, especially regarding the concentration of control, the, the controlling over the concentration of uh, pathogens. So here we are using two typical pathogen uh, bacteria pathogens that we see E. coli and inocula, to so making the whole um, contamination and cleaning procedure. As you can see by simple water rinse, thirty seconds in tap water, we can already cleaning, uh, achieving two log of reduction regarding the bacteria concentration, which we should mention that this is, should be efficient enough as of we imagine the potential application scenario of jelly ice in the real case. Um, but if you want to achieve further complete kind of cleaning of jelly ice surface, um, you can further include a very diluted bleach solution, 3, 30 to 50 ppm, to complete to achieve complete peel of the bacteria on surface of jelly ice, but all these tests we are uh, we done them under a virgin jelly ice, which is our first prototype. And later we think it it will be beneficial if we can attach those jelly ice cubes with a optional microbial resistant performance. So they will be microbial resistant themselves and do not require any addition contribution from Clorox. So here we are achieving the whole performance with gel MSB JICs, which is the prototype that we incorporated the uh, water soluble water vitamin K derivative to kill bacteria. So MSB here not only function as the photo cross linker, they also function as the photosensitizer to kill bacteria via generate a reactive oxygen species under daylight or UVA. As you can see here, we're able to achieve very consistent reduction two to three locks to bacteria. Also, they are even available, uh, also very broad spectrum antimicrobial tools, fungi and common yeast species that can survive in cold environment. And what we realize is with gel MSB GICs, the antimicrobial performance are very stable along 10 application free skull cycles. Um, and as we mentioned, um, the whole antimicrobial performance was supported by the robust reactive oxygen species production under daylight of MSB. Uh, so here we were able to detect the generation of hydroxy radicals, hydrogen peroxide, and singlet oxygens, all three species very stably productive along 10 application cycles and are, uh, the radiation of daylight. And lastly, we are eager to know if this created material, they are biodegradable or compostable. Um, they're proven to be definitely biodegradable. Um, I didn't got the chance to put the results here, but instead I put a more interesting uh, test here is that the tomato acetylene test. So what we did was um, we want to see if we can repurpose this material at the end of their life cycle. So we crushed a jelly ice and incorporate 1% jelly ice into a big potting, of, potting soil and use that potting soil to grow tomatoes. And as you can see here, the incorporation of jelly ice, different prototypes, they all boost the growth of tomatoes. So definitely 
um, jelly ice at the end of the life cycle, they can be doubled as fertilizers. So at this point, we have successfully demonstrated that our fabricated prototypes can exhibit all the proposed characteristics of jelly ice in the beginning. Um, but as material scientists, we've also identified some several um, critical parameters that require precise control to ensure the jelly ice stable performance. Um, one thing that we found is that the stability of the hydrogel can be compromised by the significant damage formed by the formation of ice rays during freezing. Therefore, how to manage the hydrogel stability in response to the freeze flow cycle became a critical question to us. Um, one primary factor that we found that can potentially determine the structure of our hydrogels is the freeze flow conditions, especially the freezing process itself. Our observation indicate that the lower freezing temperature, which here uh, is minus 196 degrees Celsius achieved by liquid nitrogen freeze, um, they can lead to much faster freeze rate, which in turn remarkably fully diminish the size of the ice grains formed. And by reducing this ice grain size, we can result with hydrogel 3D polymer networks with much homogeneous pore size distribution with smaller pore, uh, pore size. And we further expand our research to include this theoretical schematic drawings and to explicitly detail what happens within the hydrogel during freeze and thawing under various conditions. This also inspired us and guided our further investigation on controlling those cross-linking conditions of hydrogels to realize optional, optimal hydrogel um, structures. And um, here we wanna mention briefly that the subsequent research we explored is how physical and chemical cross-linkings can affect the structure and the function of jelly ice. And we listed the two papers here where we focused particularly on the implication of MSB, the photo cross-linking agent, um, how we can strategically uh, tune in the fine structure of hydrogels and uh, further attend the most effective structure to function as jelly ice. We don't have time to go in detail, but if you have questions, we're open to them post this seminar. Um, in conclusion, we reached um, reach to the conclusion that uh, through the fabricated prototypes, uh, we were able to realize this proposed features of new cooling media jelly ice, making them to be microbial resistant, compostable, customizable with very high cooling efficiency, very comparable to traditional ice. And most importantly, they have no melt water after they thawed. And along with the research, we were able to talk to different stakeholders as well. And we realized this new cooling media, they can potentially not only uh, function in the food sector, they also have very high potential benefiting the life science and pharmaceutical industry. So our ultimate goal is that um, this research can have a broader impact on the overall sustainability and efficiency of the global cold chain. And by reducing the water and plastic consumption, we can cut the waste across industries and strive to make a positive impact on human health as well as the health of our planet Earth. And here we wanna acknowledge the support from USDA and uh, NEPA to this research, as well as the Desk for, uh, uh, Graduate Research Award and UC Davis Food System Innovation. Um, we have two patents filed along with the University of California on this technology. And here we welcome any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating presentation. So uh, as now the question and answer is open. Um, so if you would like to answer, uh, to ask questions, please uh, raise your hands or put it in the, uh, the Q&A section as well. Um, yes. Can I come in with a quick question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Very fascinating, you know, uh, presentation for somebody like myself who is not from the field. 
Can you just explain quickly to me what jelly ice actually is? How do you produce it? And how does it cool? Just for somebody who is really outside the field, it seems like a new medium, but I want to understand like the basics of what jelly ice is. Yes, thank you, thank you for the question, Dr. Schneider. Um, um, so jelly ice is, is essentially a hydrogel material. What hydrogel material is, is you can imagine um, a jello um, that you can you just eat. Uh, but instead, we don't eat jello, we freeze them. And this typical jello, they have very high uh, mechanical strength, means they are not easy to be crushed when they're thawed. Um, and the status and application of jelly ice is very similar if you imagine uh, the use of plastic gel packs, that when you have it, you freeze them in the freezer. And then once they freeze it, uh, frozen, they got really rigid and hard. Um, you can apply them to any commodities that you want to pull. Um, and then later they will fill. Um, for gel packs, they will be very flexible and soft after fill. But jelly ice, they remain as a solid. Uh, they can they also become back to the status of jello, um, but they don't melt or leach any water after filling. So that's the idea of jelly ice. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, any other questions you would like to ask? I think what 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 people are maybe uh, thinking about the question. Um, I have one question that you know. Uh, now that you you get it into into the stage, um, are there uh, challenges? I'm sure there will be challenges. But what what are the challenges that you would think you would encounter in um, scaling up production of the GLS cubes for commercial use, and how? Uh, how are you thinking about addressing these challenges? Uh, that's a really good question. So um, um, as you mentioned, we're actively working towards the commercialization of this technology. It is very challenging for all the technologies to um, get out from lab to the market. Um, one challenge we can see is how we can scale up this material. Um, in the past, we uh, produce everything in the lab scale, uh, but in the future, we envision them to be very easily, they need to be very easily and cheaply produced in a um, industry scale, um, which was exactly what I've been working on for the past year. And very luckily, we were able to conquer the challenge and uh, found a new scalable fabrication method. Um, in the future, we need to see more um, in-field tests about these materials regarding production as well as application. Um, other challenges may also come from how we can sustainably provide a package for this material, because essentially we, we haven't included any synthetic polymers, but as a product, they always need a package. How can we make a very sustainable package for them is another question that I've been working on right now. Also, um, for jelly ice, we've been using um, gelatin as the concept proving material, but I can see that in the future, we need to explore other biomass as the feedstock so that we can further enhance the sustainability of this material. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can have one more question before we open it up for both of the presentations. So does anybody has any questions? There's one uh, in Q&A. Let's see, the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So it says, uh, as a key concern with uh, traditional ice slurries is that the extra weight that can be associated with transporting it along with the food, how does your jelly ice compare to the weight of the equivalent amount of ice that would be needed? Oh, that's a good question. So um, unfortunately, we have to admit that um, jelly ice is also as heavy as ice. Um, and um, to achieve efficient cooling, we have to compromise um, some weight, like actual weight provided by jelly ice. But the good news is that we did a comparison of jelly ice and plastic gel packs. Um, we found that because jelly ice, they are so moldable, we can mold exact precision engineered inner cells um, that perfectly surround small items typically. 
so that we can shrink the whole shipping package uh, volume by 55%, which means there will be much less footprint. And in the uh, lab test, two pounds of jelly ice outperform three pounds of plastic gel packs. So that's one good news. Um, and we hope in the future, we can further increase the heat, um, heat absorbing efficiency of jelly ice so that we can attach less weight to the packages. Thank you. Um, uh, we have uh, another 10 minutes or so for uh, discussion, for uh, overall discussion of both the presentations. So um, it's open for, for discussion. So anybody who has questions, please uh, go ahead, raise your hand. I see one already. Go ahead, uh, Christina. You're muted. Sorry, thank you very much. Yes, I just also put my, my camera on. I think it's nicer to... Uh, see the presenters. Um, thank you so much for the the presentation. Super interesting again. Um, and you you already answered the my initial question that I had about the predicted uh, production cost and the processes for you know scaling up the production of this jelly ice. And and you said that's that's what you, something you, the challenge and that's what you're going to look at. But. Uh, I wanted to still ask further on this. Are you? Do you think it will be possible to use this or to develop it in such a way that it can be used in, for example, um, uh, regions that are hotter than, for example, California, uh, in in Asia or in Africa, or so where, um, yeah, where more extreme temperatures and also where cost and uh, the ease of production will be really essential to be able to use this. So it's a, a long term question, but and, and then who would you do you envisage who you may want to work with for this? So it's really so super interesting, but wanting to understand what your thinking is on this. Thank you for the question. I can try to answer it and Dr. Sam may be able to add more if you have more opinion. Um, so for me right now, what I see with this material is uh, um, as a new technology, it definitely has a higher cost, um, especially we're trying to build a fully bio-based material. That means from the raw feedstock, it is much more expensive than synthetic polymers. Um, what I can, what we cannot control is the com uh, price of those raw material. Um, but what we can control is that we can try to do more research and find more alternative biomass with lower cost that can be potentially used for the fabrication of jelly ice. Uh, but with that, we are looking at more research that in the following years. Um, as of their application in hot areas like um, tropical areas or California, um, we uh, actually, the situation is very similar um, as you use a piece of ice or gel pack to combat the very hot outside environment temperature. You have to use more jelly ice or gel pack or ice to keep the commodity cool for a long time. So it's just a um, problem of heat exchange. Um, the um, the uh, amount of heat that can be absorbed by jelly ice stays the same, no matter if it's put in a hot area or a cold area. Um, what matters is uh, the amount of jelly ice applied and the amount of objects that you want to cool. Um, how is those comparison really decides how long jelly ice can support those food staying cool. So with hot area, we definitely need to use more jelly ice uh, per se. Hope that answers your question. I should, I, I should have introduced uh, Professor Gang Sun and uh, Lucian Wang, who uh, mentored uh, Dr. Zhou and her uh, and this fascinating work. And uh, Professor uh, Sun is with us. Uh, yeah. So if you would like to add anything more, please go ahead. I, I think Jia Han uh, answered pr uh, very good and uh, to those questions. And obviously, here, um, this work as a uh, as a concept proof. And now we could make some reusable solid ice, right? And also biodegradable. So you could see that the, the, the preliminary requirements all met by uh, the developed uh, jelly ice. But 
there are issues. One is a little bit costly, right? And and but we we're still ice with the name called ice is based is still the water based. So this jelly ice, and if you look at it, it contains more than ninety percent water, still water, but it doesn't melt. So that's the case. Secondly, is that uh, you also uh, we we are going to have many options to find the bio-based polymers and uh, as alternatives for this. Okay, and in fact. Uh, uh, this research already triggered some other new development uh, in that you might see uh, the papers very soon to come out from different research group and uh, and using the same uh, following the same concept. So and also Jahan answered another issue is that for shipping a cold chain product, we need to have a cooling media. We also have an insulation material. And in, in fact, the package is a uh, Packaging material is the major cost, a major waste source. I hope you understand it now. And uh, one of this insulation material is the styrofoam, and you, we we know. But with the use of our jelly ice cubes, as Jahan mentioned, we could reduce the size, right? Reduce the volume, and reduce this, and pr providing the efficiency. So. We, we we have to have an insulation material. And obviously, if someone will address the issue of uh, making this styrofoam re replaced with the bio-based styrofoam, that would be also wonderful for the for the whole world, for the whole environment. I hope this um, just add a little bit to Christina's question. Yeah. Thank you uh, for, for, for the answer. Um, so maybe we have uh, one or two questions. Uh, um, uh, one is related to to toxicity. Uh, if the product was made uh, from non-toxic materials and whether it poses any risk of uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, and also uh, if you can comment on uh, production cost as well. I, I, these are all bio-based materials and uh, it's about uh, and and in fact, uh, uh, Jahan already developed some of this uh, edible. So you could eat, you could use as cooling media, put it in there, you drink it and also eat it, the ice, as ice. So, uh, and so there's no toxic. And um, even though we, we could, uh, we, we may use it at the beginning to use some kind of a toxic chemical to prove the concept, but then later on, we have to develop into this, uh, the real, environmentally friendly or edit, you know, we call the compostable and then edible. So you really raise the bar on your material and on, on the chemicals used for making the product for different applications. So I think Jaha actually made all the different efforts already. Right. Any comment on the production cost, how much is going to uh, Jaha can cost. also. <laughs> <laughs> she, has, she has started. She has started this for the past year. Yeah, we've been. Um, what we can say is not a very precise price range. Uh, what we can say is, uh, we anticipate the production is very, uh, subject to the scalability uh, regarding cost. Um, and the majority of the cost may come from the feedstock instead of the fabrication method. Because in the past year, we were able to create a new, uh, very scalable fabrication method, uh, which is very adaptable to current um, injection molding method in, in widely applied in industry. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think uh, that's great. Um, it just, there's one more question about um, how does jelly ice compare to dry ice? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and we've been explaining um, so much about the performance compared to traditional ice. I didn't touch on dry ice because um, dry ice and ice, we see them uh, serve for a different type of food of storage, typically. Uh, dry ice, you, you normally use them only for ice creams, uh, something that need to be very hardly frozen. Um, but I, I, we are not comparing with dry ice because 
they are serving for a different temperature range. We typically design jelly ice in the range of zero to four degrees Celsius to keep food chilled, but not frozen. Thank you. I, I, I would like to uh, give the stage to uh, uh, Wu Su, I, my, my colleague. No, there is one yeah, more question. Uh, Dr. So, Bin, so Dr. Bin Lu has uh, raised the hand. Yes. yes, I know. I know. So I think who, 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 who is going to take over the, the moderation from here? I'll oh, see. no worries. Thank you, Hermes. Um, yeah, Bing, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks. So I just have one research idea potentially can connect my research with Dr. Zhou and Dr. Sun's research. So there are also sensing technologies that, that can evaluate the quality of the food or the, or the product as well as the temperature. So if there are sensors to uh, in real time to monitor the freshness and also quality of the food as well as detect the temperature, um, let's say reduction, if there's any clear uh, reduction of the temperature and also reduction of the um, food quality. And then that's the time to add maybe more uh, ice and maybe the, um, the gel ice you just mentioned to the needed areas, not apply the ice to the all the, let's say all the food, but only to the needed areas. So make the process more sustainable and more uh, effective. But I see that is very, very interesting. That's definitely, uh, precision control over the temperature. Um, yes, I, I see uh, why that is very needed. Um, and I really appreciate this idea and you share that with us. Mm -hmm. Hope we can achieve some collaborations in the future. Yeah, thanks. Oh, fantastic, actually. So that was my question <laughs> related. <laughs> uh, we listen to different set of the technologies, one in the precision agriculture and the one security, a uh, uh, food security wise, um, that the cooling, right, the material development. Can you have some opportunity to collaborate these two, right, for the food security in the region, like a hotter region? Uh, I wasn't thinking that. And then you already met two, two of you. <laughs> yeah, cool. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. So Con Conrad, please go ahead. And then after that, Mingju, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, it's very interesting um, presentation and also the, the product is uh, just an idea is there any uh, possibility of uh, expanding this uh, jelly ice uh, to the use of uh, using the like uh, we, uh, we call it from from the point of view of uh, smallholder farmers? Is there any? any material that they can use to replicate, even though it's on, still new technology, but we are from Asia, so mostly we have a lot of uh, biomass, but also a lot of uh, difficulties in expanding this kind of technology. Is there any idea where it should be in the future that the development of this technology is accessible for smallholder farmers? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I don't know if Dr. Sai want to take that question, but uh, from my perspective, I think um, I do understand that the urge from um, general consumers or farmers, they want to use more efficient cooling efficient, uh, cooling material in their production or uh, work. Um, and we are trying all of our best um, to collaborate or um, find potential alternative that can accelerate um, the application of this new material. Um, but I mean, we have to say it will take some time before we can find a really good solution um, that we can um, generally apply this to different aspects, especially 
um, with Jelly Eyes, the feature is that it is very customizable in all different performances. And we hope we can achieve the best performance for different end users. For example, if you want them to be single use or reusable, um, if you want them to be in big size or small size or specifically design any shape to fit, for example, strawberry or broccoli or crab, they can be fit in very different shapes. Um, so that is something that potentially we want to work closely with different industry partners in the future. And we, I personally really hope this technology can be applied at least in one specific area in short time. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jiahan. You did a good question. And uh, Jiahan answered well, because uh, as a uh, as Jiahan mentioned, it's a customizable and uh, you could, all the farmers could make it uh, on site. If the farmers are making those and also are using rice, there's a potential to be replaced uh, by using these uh, uh, jelly ice cubes. And the Jiahan also mentioned, I think that in the fishing, and the, the seafood industry and the farmers. And that already we, we saw a lot of interest that they can shape the lobster, which is a high value product, right? And they can you can customize the, the, the jelly ice cube into just a, a perfect the lobster size. So you will see a much smaller shaping size and a, a low weight for shaping the individual products. Thank you, gang. So uh, you. we have uh, just about one or two minutes. So maybe last a quick question from Mingju, and then we can wrap up the webinar session today. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question, I, I got a very quick question. First one is, did you determine the ice jelly product lifespan? Because uh, usually the product like this one, they cannot use forever. Yeah, but for the ice, they can melt, but this one cannot. So how can you handle if they are, uh, uh, I mean, they need to throw out, they will become the bee waste. That's my qu one question. Another one is, could, could you clean this kind of product? Because they can directly contact to the or fish or some other meat. So if they cannot clean, they maybe have some fish flavor or something, then my cross contaminate other, also can, Cross contaminate other food. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, those are great questions. Thank you for raising them. Um, first question about um uh about uh, forgot the first question. Could you could someone <laughs> uh, the, the the lifespan? Oh I mean, yes, the, the lifespan. lifespan. Yes. yes. So jelly eyes um potentially uh, um they can be used for many, many cycles. We are testing them against up to 15 freestyle cycles right now. Um, they actually are pretty well even after 15 freestyle cycles, but we didn't end up with uh, testing more because we uh, realized that this is a product that has potential direct contact with food. So we want them to have actually a very, uh, relatively limited lifetime. And we hope people can compost them and then pick a new one to use after a certain cycles, especially in the scenario, as you mentioned in the second question, when they have direct contact with seafood or any food with strong flavors. Um, that's also the benefit with jelly ice, um, regardless of cost here. Um, the environmental concerns associated with you ditch a jelly ice is very, very low because they are uh, fully compostable. They will not cause any environmental burden. So even if you wanna use them as single use, you can compost them directly if you think it's too fishy or if, if it's too garlic, strong, uh, whatever. <laughs> but in general, if they only have some minor dirts or uh, something a soap can clean. Jelly ice is safe to be cleaned in soap water, um, even some very diluted chloric solution, which we can, uh, uh, we have some test results uh, supporting that they will efficiently reduce the microbial concentration to do three locks reduction already. Um, but yes, in general, um, that is very dependent on the end users uh, need if they think they want to keep using them, they can use uh, soap water and Clorox to clean them or tap water. Um, if they hope to ditch them, um, they can ditch them and then find a new piece to use. 
Okay, so thank you so much, Jahan. Thanks, um, everybody. I I like to thank again to both of our speakers today, um, Dr. Bing Nu and then Dr. Jia Han Zhou. So very thank you very much for your uh, inspiring talks and uh, uh very uh, the involved question series together. Okay, and and also we like to thank two universe two co-host universities uh, organizers in UC Davis and uh, SFU. So we look forward to seeing uh next webinar series. As uh, as you know, the next one is scheduled um May on May first and May second. May first in North American time and May second um the Asian time, right? And um it's gonna be co-hosted between the NUS, National University of Singapore, and the NTU, uh, Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. So uh, it's gonna be fascinating. Details will be shared uh, closer to the date. And also please see the APRU's webpage for your um, contact information for the working group and the speakers, and et cetera. So thank you uh, uh, again to all the participants today and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the, in the second series. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much. much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank to everybody. You. Bye. Take care. Bye.